Let me apologize in advance for um, the fact I'm a little under the weather and neither my energy uh, nor my voice may be as, as uh, robust as usual, but I hope that, it, uh, I, hope that I can make myself heard and, and with, uh, uh, with enough enthusiasm that you realize I do care about what I'm talking about. And, uh, I'd like to start just by reiterating uh, something that Steve said in the last session, one of the last things that, that he mentioned, which was the importance of seizing control of the evidence for, uh, about education by education researchers. I'm, I think it is easy to forget uh, that <clears throat> education has become important to nations in ways that it, it wasn't when I started in education research. And I think because of that, uh, not only is education as a research area, but education uh, policy and, you know, and the, the doing of education practice uh, have become important in ways that, that they weren't. And that means that they're going, it's going to be a battleground for contention of who owns it who owns education research, who's, who, who is there to speak about education research, who's, who, and uh, I think it's quite important that people who know something about education practice be some of the voices that uh, ultimately are the ones that are speaking with authority about evidence in education. There are plenty of other voices that are happy to uh, colonize that territory, uh, and I think that if we are not uh, very careful well, we could we could find ourselves being in say schools of education uh, and having absolutely no voice in education policy, and uh, I really think it's crucial for us to recognize that danger and avoid it. Be partly because some of the others who might be interested in uh, in in uh, colonizing the education research territory uh, have different views about what's important and what needs to be paid attention to. You know, curriculum and instruction seems like a non-issue to an economist, but to those of us who think learning and teaching, you know, have something to do with what children learn, uh, might feel differently. So that's just one, that, that is one comment. Let me <coughs> also apologize, in addition to my voice, uh, to the, a bit for the title of my talk. Um, I chose as a title, uh, Meta-Analysis and Evidence-Based Policy. And whenever I use the word evidence-based policy, or the phrase evidence-based policy, I always realize that it is actually not what I mean. Those words are not exactly what I mean. What I mean is evidence-informed policy. I hope that policy and practice will be informed by education, but not determined entirely by it, because that kind of a, a, a slavish dependence, I think, uh, does no credit to uh, either professionals or to researchers. I organized what I had to say today around some of the critiques that, that uh, I've seen recently of meta-analysis and meta-analysis in education. And uh, so uh, I'm, I'm trying not to seem defensive, but also to try to, try to uh, I think, uh, recognize some important things that we have to pay attention to. When I heard Dylan's talk this morning, I, I commented to him even before his talk that I suspected that we, many of us here are going to sound like we're singing from the same choir book, uh, in spite of the fact that he, uh, we may be cast in different lights as defenders or critics. Uh, I think we recognize some of the same principles uh, that are important to pay attention to. So the first point I want to make is I think meta-analysis has assumed a crucial role in evidence-based policy and practice in a number of fields, uh, in medicine, in prevention science, in psychology, in environmental sciences, and in education. And uh, as has already been mentioned, I think it's important to separate um, meta-analysis as a branch of statistics from any particular meta-analysis or, or, or any particular style of meta-analyses, and there are several. Um, there's frequent confusion, I think, uh, sometimes between uh, meta-analysis, meaning the statistical methods that are involved in systematic reviewing, and the broader enterprise of systematic reviewing as a scientific process. And you know, just reiterating what Dylan said earlier, uh, the concept of systematic reviewing encompasses all aspects, um, those that are statistical and those that are not so explicitly statistical, of synthesizing research findings to draw conclusions. Uh, Meta-analysis is, as I think of it, that somewhat narrower 
part of uh, systematic reviewing that, that has to do with uh, combining estimates of effects. Now, I think because meta-analysis as the branch of statistics that deals with combining evidence, um, you know, uh, acro either across studies or within studies, uh, has flourished over the last 40 years or so, um, <clears throat> it's become a fundamental method in statistics. When I began as a, uh, as a uh, uh, new, well, as a graduate student and then a new young professor, meta-analysis was kind of a quirky idea that, <clears throat> that many statisticians didn't even think ought to be part of the field of statistics. But at some point, uh, that changed, and meta-analysis has become sort of a fundamental branch of statistics uh, that is um, used not just for combining evidence across studies, but as a tool in mathematical statistics to combine evidence within studies. And, and so it's, it's become something that, that um, I think is here to stay. Uh, if there are multiple quantitative studies that provide insight about an educational problem, I think meta-analysis will inevitably be invoked to, uh, to deal with that. So in one sense, I think the train has left the station or whatever metaphor you want to use. Meta-analysis will be here for the foreseeable future as a technique for combining evidence. Now, the thing is, the issues of the validity of meta-analysis as a statistical method are going to be settled largely by the usual methods of mathematical statistics, um, deductive and mathematical methods, um, and the, it'll, the, the sort of ways of knowing are the, are the technical ways of knowing uh, uh, in other mathematical sciences. But the question of whether any particular statistical analysis, including meta-analyses, uh, is scientifically informative is not just a matter of mathematics. Um, the question of scientific informativeness involves scientific judgment that has to necessarily go outside the scope of the mathematical sciences. Now, technical issues are, are, are relevant, but they're seldom completely determinative. Uh, you know, in, in other words, it's pretty easy to know whether the technical methods of meta-analysis are valid or not. Um, it's not so easy to know whether or not any application of those methods to, to scientific evidence in education or any other field uh, uh, is in fact a valid application. I think it's important for us to keep that in mind. And, in, and the spirit of the discussion today is, is very much that um, the technical issues aren't the problem. It's these other issues at the interface of uh, the technical issues, the statistical issues, and the science. Um, Critics have emerged recently about the use of meta-analysis to inform policy. Um, and that, I think that's not an accident that it's happened now because now um, <clears throat> methods to inform policy and practice have started to become more formalized in the form of uh, things like research clearinghouses and in things like the education toolkit. Uh, I think we should welcome the kind of criticism that we've been hearing today. Um, and I noted particularly a paper by Adrian Simpson, who's here in Durham, and Bob Slavin in my own country, um, uh, who have been both been critics of the, of the way meta-analysis has been used. And I think their criticism is important for us to pay attention to and um, important for us to, um, to use in trying to inform the practice of systematic reviewing using meta-analysis. So part of what I would like to do today is talk a little bit about some of those criticisms and, uh, and point out and, and go a little bit further than some of those criticisms, uh, but also to point out that these criticisms aren't new. Uh, in the early days of meta-analysis, people were talking about most of these things. And um, we've somehow kind of forgotten about that or we haven't paid as much attention to it in the, in the uh, ensuing years. And I think part of the reason is that the technical issues of doing meta-analysis have a kind of attractive feature that you can find truth, mathematical deductive truth, and it's very attractive to do that kind of stuff, and it's actually easier than dealing with some of the other things. And so I think part of the reason we've, we've seen some of the issues that are resurfacing today uh, not be in the foreground for the entire 
period since meta-analysis began has to do with the, uh, the ease in which one can uh, deal with technical issues and the difficulty uh, of some of these other issues. But because I'm cast in the role as apologist for, for uh, meta-analysis, I, I want to say a little bit about my own background so you can situate me and then decide for yourself about my obvious prejudices um, uh, in this great evidence debate. So I, I want to <laughs> mention that I began working on statistical aspects of meta-analysis in 1978 uh, when I was a graduate student and when some of you were not yet born. Um, my, my early work was devoted to developing statistical methods for meta-analysis and understanding the shortcomings of alternatives to meta-analysis. I'll say a word about both of those things. The developing statistical methods for meta-analysis was interesting in those days because there were people who said, um, this isn't legitimate statistics. And um, it's, really, uh, it's really a shame to, for people to be masquerading this stuff as if it was something as important as statistics. And one of the stories I always tell about this is when I went to the University of Chicago for my first job, I was pleased that the dean of the, of the division that I worked in was a statistician, uh, Bill Kruskal. And I thought, this is great. Kruskal will understand my work. And um, uh, I will get a reasonable hearing from him anyway. You know, Maybe I'll even get tenure and be able to stay in the university. And, um, I didn't realize at that time that Bill Kruskal had the uh, habit of calling you up at 10 o'clock on Saturday night to discuss uh, various things he had in mind. He was kind of an insomniac. Uh, but one day, early on in my career, I, he invited me to lunch. And I thought, wow, this is great. The dean is inviting me to lunch. And um, as we were on the way to the Quadrangle Club, where, which was the faculty club at the University of Chicago, he put his arm around me. And that was odd, because he was not a warm man. And, uh, <laughs> He said something that I remember as roughly like this, Larry, my boy, you're a smart kid. You could do something important. Why are you working on meta-analysis? You know, it's not a real thing. <laughs> and I began to think about what I was going to do after I didn't get tenure at the University of Chicago. And, uh, but fortunately, um, the world changed, and people began to understand that this was pretty important stuff with, uh, before I had to be um, uh, awarded tenure or, or not. So. Early in my career, I, I did a lot of technical work. I did, a, I did some substantive work, some, some uh, uh, actual substantive meta-analyses. Uh, uh, in, in later years, uh, for a period of about 10 or 15 years, I didn't work much on meta-analysis. I did a lot of work on randomized trials and uh, carried out randomized trials, did a lot of work on large-scale measurement and assessment. Um, I, I was involved in meta-analysis, oddly enough, more in medicine than I was in education for a while. I was involved in development of some of the first wave of clinical practice guidelines in medicine. Um, and when the, when the first, what I'm now calling research clearinghouses got established, and those include the Campbell Collaboration, the Cochrane Collaboration, the What Works Clearinghouse, and something called Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development, when those operations were getting started, I, I was very involved in, in all of them in one way or another, less so in Cochrane than any of, than any of the rest. But I, I did um, get involved in trying to you know, help launch things. Um, but <coughs> after sort of an initial sort of help with working in clearing houses, I really re didn't do much of that work. I really did much more work in trying to help uh, the new um, U.S. Institute of Education Sciences get randomized trials done in, uh, in the U.S. And uh, ultimately, then I wound up being a chair of the Education Science Board, which governs the IES, which is a position which I hold now. So I've been in and out of the, of the, the throes of work on meta-analysis, both technical work and uh, wor more practical work of what I'm calling clearing houses over the years. So clearly, I'm a partisan, and and you know you have to take anything I have to say with a certain grain of salt because of that. The first thing that I, I think is important for us all to recognize, uh, although it's kind of obvious, I want to say it anyway. Um, when social indicators start to have high stakes, they're vulnerable to corruption. Every social scientist I've ever met understands this principle about every social indicator. Um, and what do I mean by corruption? It means that people learn to get a high value on the indicator without having 
uh, at least as much of the thing the indicator is supposed to indicate. And so as effect sizes become social indicators uh, that have high stakes of various kinds, then we should expect them to be corrupted in various ways. Now that doesn't mean we can't push back and try to overcome the corruption. I'm just saying this is not unusual. This is absolutely to be expected. Maintaining the validity of effect sizes for any particular purpose is going to require a continuing effort on the part of the community, uh, the, us, uh, those interested in research synthesis and systematic reviewing. It's going to require a continuing effort um, uh, to make sure that they don't get corrupted. Uh, I think uh, Simpson and, and Slavin have identified some of the ways in which effect sizes can become corrupted. Um, and uh, it's probably pretty smart for us to pay attention to their criticisms. Um, one idea in particular that I think is something of a straw man, and we should, we should call it out when we, when we see it, it mentioned, that, um, and I'm gonna, in, 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 in what I'm saying here, I'm gonna refer specifically to the standardized mean difference, but the general principle applies to other effect sizes as well. I, I wanna emphasize that too. It's not the specifics of what comes next apply only to standardized mean difference perhaps, but, but the first principle is that effect sizes are dimensionless quantities um, and, and what that means is they're like numbers. They don't have any inherent meaning. Um, giving them meaning requires mapping them onto some metric whose meaning is derived externally from statistics. So is an effect size of 0.5 big or small? Impossible to say. Uh, you know, it, it isn't even a valid question to ask because there's no framework to evaluate whether 0.5 is big or small unless you embed it in some broader context that can, can give that 0.5 meaning. Um, and in the case of standardized mean differences, I think there are a bunch of things that, can, uh, that, that need to be connected to it in some way to give it meaning. One is, is sort of an outcome construct. Uh, another is a measurement plan, so we understand something about how that outcome is measured. Simply saying I'm measuring genius is, doesn't mean your measure is, is at all a credible measure of that. Um, things like sampling and plans and research designs and things like the, importantly, things like the counterfactual uh, all have to be understood in some way for the effect, for the effect size to have any meaning. So the, the first point is the outcome construct, and really, you all know this, but a 50% reduction in the risk of death uh, doesn't have the same meaning to me as a 50% reduction in the risk of itch around an injection site. Um, if you wanna debate that, then I'm happy to debate it, but I, I, I think pretty much everybody would agree. The meaning of the effect size depends on the construct it represents. And you know, this idea was pretty well known um, in the very beginnings of meta-analysis, circa 1981, Gene Glass, et cetera. But sometimes we seem to have forgotten it, and there has been a claim that we can completely divorce the interpretation of effect size from what the outcome measure is, the outcome construct is. Um, the term metric for effect sizes was much discussed in the early days of meta-analytic work in education. Uh, in 1980, uh, Barry McGaw and Jean Glass published a paper in the American Education Research Journal uh, about outcome metrics uh, for effect sizes, by which they meant uh, the type of standard deviation that was being used in the denominator. And examples that they talked about were the sort of raw post-test, the gain score or a covariate adjust, the gain score standard deviation or a covariate adjusted standard deviation. And, you know, Glass, at all and people doing meta-analysis at that time and actually people doing meta-analysis now understand that these metrics are different and the very same data can lead to very different effect sizes depending on which one of those things you happen to be using. And the point isn't that any one of them is right, it's that the meaning of the effect size changes depending on which one of them you're happening to, happening to use. And if you're confusing two or three of them in the same meta-analysis using effects computed using two or three different ones of these things, you're probably going to be in a hopeless mess in trying to understand what the data mean. Um, 
all these ideas were included in, in uh, Glass's book, Glass McGon Smith's book on meta-analysis in 1981. They covered this in some great detail. Um, another point that, as, that was brought up um, in, has been brought up in recent critiques is the idea that, well, standardized mean differences are, are meaningless, and, I, and I'm perhaps caricaturing the criticism just to, just to, to make the point obvious. Um, standardized mean differences are meaningless because the standard deviation can be manipulated. And, you know, and as, as a logical point, that's true. Um, but I'll, I will point out that pre-1981, I know that Gene Glass was writing about um, a particular case in, in, in which um, the, um, the, the size, of, in which the manipulation of the size of the standard deviation was important, and that was extreme group designs. One kind of research design you can do that actually increases power is to um, essentially stratify the data uh, before before assignment to treatments, and then use only the most extreme groups. You know, the the the, the, the top and bottom twenty percent of, of the data, and do an experiment that that um, uh, randomly assigns those, for example, those extreme groups to treatments. And uh, if you work through the mathematics, you see that it leads to you know, more statistical power if the uh, stratification variable is, is one. You stratify on a covariate, typically, if the, if the covariate's related to the outcome. And it, the Glass was pretty clear that you, know, you had to take that into account in computing a standardized mean difference. Otherwise, you were going to have these tiny standard deviations that, that were associated with just the extremes. And that was going to make the effect size artif artifactually larger. But the same principle happens with reconstructing factorial designs. That was another big deal in early, early meta-analyses. If, if you have a design in which you have treatment as one factor, and then a whole bunch of other factors that are designed to control variation, you shouldn't use the within-cell standard deviation as the standard deviation for computing the effect size, because it's, because it's artifactually small compared to the standard deviation within treatment groups. But you can put the sums of squares back together and, and recompose a standard deviation that is, is more meaningful, or at least probably more consistent with those of other studies. So these were ideas that were, were pretty well understood in, in those days. I think they're still understood by a lot of us, but not all of us who do meta-analysis. Um, range restriction was another, um, uh, uh, is uh, in, a, in a sense related to this. And I'll just point out that uh, it's been pointed out by recent critiques that well, if you restrict the range, you can really change the standardized mean difference. Well, that's true, um, but it's not new news. Uh, particularly psychometric meta-analyses that are designed to study validity generalization have been concerned about this since the very late 1970s. Uh, in fact, uh, the first book on psychometric meta-analysis in 1982 involved you know, extensive methodology for correcting for restriction of range. This is a big deal in the meta-analyses they do because in, in um, you know, the, the validity generalization world is usually trying to assess the, the validity of employment selection tests. They have a test, they employ people, uh, usually people who score high on the test. Then they want to calculate the correlation between the test score and the job performance. But they don't employ everybody. They employ only a small fraction of the people. And the fraction is highly variable between studies. And so this means that the effect size is profoundly influenced, and the effect size there is a correlation, by the way, it's profoundly influenced by restriction of range. Um, and so that, this, was, this was something that's pretty well understood for um, a long time. And work has continued, and they've got many more elaborate ways of, uh, of uh, adjusting for various kinds of restriction of range. Um, Another issue that comes up is the psychometric properties of outcome variables. Um, obviously, whether the outcome is a good or a bad measure of the construct it's supposed to be measuring has got to make a difference in, in how you would interpret the effect size. And to fix on two concepts, not the two most sophisticated or the two only concepts uh, of evalu psychometric evaluation of a measure, there's reliability and there's validity. Um, a measure can be unreliable, um, in which case it may not be so good. Uh, a measure can be invalid, meaning it's not very perfectly correlated with what it's supposed to be measuring. And 
it turns out that the, the consequences of these two things for standardized mean differences has been known. I wrote a paper in 1981 in the Journal of Educational Statistics, um, and this turns out to be the paper that is very highly cited uh, when people want to cite Hedges G, um, but not very well read because some of this other stuff is, is in that paper and nobody ever talks about it, or maybe they just don't think it's important. But in, in the paper, one of the things I did was to, was to demonstrate that like correlation coefficients, standardized mean difference are attenuated by unreliability. And um, there's an unreliability formula that shows basically um, that the effect size using, using an outcome measure that has measurement error is smaller than the effect size would have been had the true scores been used you know, under some assumptions. And the relationship between the two is the square root of the reliability as a, a factor of that. Um, and <coughs> in a subsequent paper, I, I showed how this kind of idea could be used to, to clarify subgroup analyses. Um, I, I can say pretty convincingly that, uh, or at least very confidently, that these results haven't been used much, uh, or at least very often. Um, but the corresponding ideas for people do, who deal with uh, correlation coefficients seem to have been used more often. But I want to talk about validity for a minute because this actually has an implication for um, the, um, the correspondence or the relationship between effect sizes and the, and the specificity of treatment effects or specificity of outcome measures. In the same paper, I talked about a related model to the reliability model in which you imagine that the, the, uh, the outcome measure isn't a unidimensional thing. It contains two pieces, essentially. One piece is impacted by the treatment, and the other piece is not impacted by the treatment. So the idea is that other piece isn't unreliability. Uh, it's something consistently measured by the outcome measure. It just has nothing to do with treatment. Treatment has no impact on it. And it turns out that you can show that um, if you have a measure that's invalid in this, particularly, in this particular way, uh, that the effect size that you get on the invalid measure is related to the effect size you would have gotten if you'd only been measuring the component that the treatment impacted. Uh, and the uh, relation has to do with the correlation between the outcome measure with the invalid component and, and, the, uh, and the valid component. Now, this is, this is, um, this is also a result that you know, hasn't gotten much use, but it, 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 it is relevant in to, to thinking about why we should expect uh, very narrow measures that are highly aligned with treatment to produce different effect sizes than, very broad, than, than if we had used very broad measures that are not entirely aligned with treatment. Um, if, in fact, um, <clears throat> what I'm calling the valid component is, is what treatment actually impacts, uh, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff being measured that treatment doesn't impact, then um, you, can, you can expect and you know, deduce quantitatively that, sure enough, um, there's not going to be a heck of a lot of, uh, a heck of a lot of, uh, well, the effect size will be attenuated. So the, the point here is, is that um, the issue of alignment of outcome measure with treatment, which is something we, I think every clearinghouse and most, I think, people doing good meta-analyses uh, worry about, uh, also has at least some technical uh, basis for worrying about that has been around for a long time. Um, another thing I want to comment about that, that I think I haven't seen so much in the recent critiques, but I think it's maybe more important than the things I have seen, and that has to do with counterfactuals and the definition of effect size. Effects, effect, treatment effects are, are definitionally um, comparisons. And what we should be saying is that um, the treatment effect of some particular thing is not, you know, should include a statement, it's the treatment of, it, it's the treatment effect of treatment A versus whatever the counterfactual was. We never say that other part about the counterfactual. 
And in fact, researchers often don't think it's important to report, um, which is probably part of why uh, it, it gets less attention than it should. But it should get attention because it's part of the definition of what the effect is that you're, you, you are trying to interpret or, or, or synthesize or whatever. Um, I will note also that Smith and Glass in their meta-analysis of psychotherapy studies and in their 1981 book talk a lot about the comparison and the counterfactual, you know, talk about that as being part of the definition of effect size. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't use a broad definition of counterfactual, but it does mean that somehow conditioning on what that counterfactual is has got to be how we get meaning out of these numbers. Um, so. This makes me, you know, part of what I've said so far would make you think that we've forgotten all the, all the stuff we used to know. Uh, purely statistical issues seem to have gotten the lion's share of the attention um, in meta-analyses, at least that are based, that are, that are aimed at scientists. And, you know, that has to, probably has something to do with people like me because those technical problems are real easy to study and there's, um, and uh, so they're attractive. But um, I think it's important especially I'm noticing that as I'm coming back into the role of working with meta-analyses to try to inform policy and practice, I think it's really important to get back in touch with some of those, some of those issues that, that were deemed important by the, by the uh, early innovators in meta-analysis. And I think part of the reason, uh, part, of the, part of the way in which this is happening is that a new role has started to emerge, and that is the role of the, um, of the synthesis expert. It turns out that synthesis is complex, involves a great deal of, um, well, methodology from, from, um, uh, from a lot of different areas, some being statistical, some being of different sorts, substantive in various ways. And I'll, I'll make a, a claim that will annoy some people, but I believe it's true. Not every competent education researcher knows what's necessary to be a competent systematic reviewer of education research. And this is not intended to be pejorative, and it's not something about education. In the physical sciences, they say the same thing. There are physical science review groups that say, basically, it takes a couple of years to turn a good physical chemist into somebody who can do reviews because they're hopeless when they begin. They don't know enough. And if that's true in physics or in physical chemistry, um, perhaps in parts of medicine, I think it's, it's, it's not an insult to say this could be true in education too. New institutions have emerged, not just new roles, but new institutions. Uh, the institution of the research clearinghouse, uh, I think, is one of the ways in which we are going to improve the quality of, the, of, the, of systematic reviews we do. Research clearinghouses are entities that support or conduct systematic reviews and have specially trained staff using specially developed procedures. Um, the What Works Clearinghouse in the US, Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development in the US, um, are examples of you know, sort of clearinghouses that identify themselves as clearinghouses, maybe even have it in the name, but very closely related are, are other institutions that support systematic reviews, like the EEF's Toolkits Project, um, and professional organizations like the Campbell Collaboration and the Cochrane Collaboration. They play an important role that didn't exist uh, before meta-analysis came along. Uh, one of the functions they perform is helping to identify relevant research studies and identifies which ones are valid enough to be trusted. And the latter is an incredibly important point because every scientist knows they can tell a good study from a bad study, but the overwhelming empirical evidence is they can't do that reliably. If we learned anything in the last 40 years, that's one of the things we have learned. And it's not a problem of education or a problem of, um, uh, of psychology or a problem um, of medicine. Uh, or experimental ecology or any one of the number of places in which this has been rediscovered. Uh, it's, a pro it's, it's just a problem that uh, to quantify quality in a way that's repeatable and therefore transparent, um, you need special procedures.
clearinghouse staffs use specialized methods and specialized and have specialized training uh, to make study quality evaluations, among other things. I mean, we, we make a huge deal of this in the What Works Clearinghouse in the US. Getting certified to be a reviewer is uh, a big deal. Um, <clears throat> now, this doesn't always mean that clearinghouses make the right decisions, but it does mean that they establish a new standard for making those kinds of decisions. They can always be improved, and I think they're, I think clearinghouses are all deeply interested in improving what they do. So I don't think they think they've solved all these problems. And uh, most recently, I've become involved again with the Campbell collaborations with the What Works Clearinghouse and with Blueprints. And it's really clear that methodological progress has been great in the statistics part of what they do, and uh, much slower in some of the more difficult and important problems that, are, that really need to be addressed to improve the quality of reviews being done. Um, and I also think that the research that's needed can't easily be done within the clearinghouses themselves. Because clearinghouses have to be slow to change, bureaucratic, and they have to be focused on producing reviews. That is, I think, a set of constraints under which they need to operate, and some of those constraints are essential to, to, to operate properly. Um, and also, I think some of the staff in clearinghouses aren't always specialists in all of the fields they might need to be to address the research problems that they uncover. And so my experience with some of the best clearinghouses, and I, I think What Works Clearinghouse and Blueprints are two of the best, um, is that they discover important methodological problems sometimes more than once because they discover them and then they revisit them 10 years later and realize it's still a problem. Do we have a procedure for that? Oh yeah, we've got a procedure. Well, what is it? Here it is. Where'd it come from? I don't know. 10 years ago, somebody made this decision. Um, often the reason for the decisions about procedure are sort of lost in the mists of history and the range of other options considered, why they actually chose the procedure they did, which fork in that multi-forking path they chose was chosen is often sort of lost. It doesn't mean that they made the wrong decision. It just means that it's, it's hard for us to figure out whether we can, we, we can agree that it was the right decision. Um, the methodological work that's needed to sort out some of this stuff is difficult and it crosses boundaries of statistics and, and wise scientific practice, uh, and often in more than one field. Uh, I, but I think this kind of work is essential to make clearinghouses better do their jobs. Um, one of the things that um, I think is uh, essential uh, is that we recognize that clearinghouses have a bigger agenda than just doing systematic reviews. They have a, an agenda to communicate with um, not just other researchers, but with practitioners and with policymakers. And I think this poses a new set of problems that people who are trying to present meta-analyses to communicate with researchers um, don't have. I mean, it's harder to be a clearinghouse, it's harder to be the toolkits than it is to write papers in Psych Bulletin or something. Because, um, uh, because you have a responsibility to understand how the ways in which you try to communicate are understood by the people you're trying to communicate with. And uh, I, my experience is often what people interpret based on what we say to them is um, surprising and not what we intended. And the, the, believe it or not, I'm not gonna go on forever. I just have a few more minutes if you'll indulge me. Um, uh, I think that there's, there's really a need for, for a science of research translation. <laughs> um, and part of the reason I believe this is, is based on parallel work in the interpretation of large-scale assessment studies in the US. The National Assessment of Educational Progress uh, is the single largest education research project in the US. It costs about $90 million a year, which is big even in US budget, budget terms. <coughs> it, collects a huge amount of data, um, and the sponsors of NAEP got interested a decade or two ago on um, how the users of that data, policymakers, legislators, teachers, interpreted um, the tables and graphs they were producing in great volume. And um, 
This led to a series of cognitive laboratory studies with teachers and policymakers. We even got some legislators into cognitive labs so we could see what they thought our graphics meant. And we found that many of the most fundamental ideas that we were trying to communicate were just not understood in the way we intended. Uh, they, in other words, reading our documents left those people not just uninformed, but incorrectly informed about what we had found about what students knew and were able to do in the US. Um, this led to a lot of changes and strangely enough, less of a desire to do any more of those cognitive studies because they gave us bad news. Um, and, but I do think it's, it's a precedent for what needs to happen for those of us who are interested in supporting research clearinghouse type activities. Um, and I think there's a bunch of, of communication issues that I could mention, but I'll, I'll mention a few here. You know, how's the best way to communicate treatment impacts to policymakers and practitioners? Is it effect sizes? Is it months of gain? Is it some kind of overlap statistic? Uh, what Works Clearinghouse seems to like that idea. Some other index, some other people have said, well, give people lots of indexes. Well, how do we know what they're gonna, how they're gonna understand that? Um, how should we best communicate uncertainty of treatment impacts? Uh, again, we've got a bunch of conventional technical ways of doing that, but do they communicate at all what we intend to, the, to a teacher or a legislator or a policymaker? We need to find out. Um, how do we communicate heterogeneity of research results? You know, one of, the, one of the things that is, I think, understandable and expectable in education work is that treatment effects are not going to be entirely consistent. How do we best convey the appropriate notion of that to the people we hope to use this. And the place, the, the last um, point that, that I'll, I'll point to, but there are many others, these are just examples of things we need to learn how to do better. Um, how, do we, how do we describe the scope of applicability of findings? Um, the, in, the, in the randomized trial world, uh, there's been a lot of work on trying to develop principled methods for generalizing from trials that have non-random samples to other inference populations of interest. Um, there's been very little of the analogous work in, in meta-analysis, but I think there, there could be. Um, there's room for it. Um, and I think some sort of principled procedures uh, for uh, helping to understand what the possible scope of applicability of findings might be, would be welcome. I'm gonna um, end by just saying that um, uh, Peter was uh, kind enough to refer to the Yidan Prize and one of the things that um, came with the prize was, a, was a, a, a research grant that has helped, has made it possible along with some other research funding from the National Science Foundation in the US to, to establish a new research center at the Institute for Policy Research at Northwestern. Uh, we're gonna call it the STEP Center for Statistics and Evidence-Based Policy and Practice. Uh, and it is co-directed by my colleague Beth Tipton, who's another uh, professor of statistics at Northwestern, and me. Um, we have enrolled a bunch of our colleagues at Northwestern, and we hope to enroll a bunch of colleagues around the world. Uh, in joining us to pursue methodological research in three areas. One is um, generating evidence to improve policy and practice. And this involves designing better studies that are more informative that, um, uh, for those purposes. Uh, synthesizing evidence across studies and translating those syntheses into understandable products for policymakers and practitioners. I've given the, the uh, uh, URL there if you're interested in going to see the website. We're just getting going. We're looking for people who are interested in being part of this with us. I'll just mention that of the three areas, we think that the last translation uh, of research for policymakers and practitioners is the least developed and most urgent area. And so we've decided in partnership with the Gates Foundation um, to plan some meetings of that involve research clearinghouses, policymakers, and practitioners um, to plan a research agenda, uh, not just for our center, but for any scholars that are interested in some of these questions. Um, 
and I hope, I don't, I don't think I'll be here a year from now, but if I was, I would hope to be able to tell you that we'd made some progress, but uh, we're trying to uh, enlist uh, people of goodwill and interest in these areas to work with us. Thank you.